Hello, good morning. Um, welcome to World Kidney Day 2023, St. Nicholas Hospital. And um, I want to thank you all for joining. My name is Foma Okafo, and I'll be the one moderating today's meeting. So um, as we all know, today, Dr. Bangui is going to be the one taking us through um, kidney health for all which this year's team is preparing for the unexpected and supporting the vulnerable. Um, Dr. Bangwe is the nephrologist here in St. Nicholas Hospital and also the clinical director. Wow. So um, without wasting any uh, further time, I'm wow. going to hand things over and so he can start. Again, thank you very much for joining, sir. Okay, thank you, Informa, and good morning, Lagos, and uh, welcome to St. Nicholas's own contribution to celebrating the World Kidney Day in the year 2023. As Informa has said, the theme for this year is preparing for the unexpected and supporting the vulnerable. And I'll, over the next 45 minutes, one hour, try to take you through a few things. First of all, speak around the topic itself. Then of course, speak around kidneys and the kidney and kidney failure. And then also in conclusion, maybe share what we as a hospital in the last 23 years of uh, being involved in kidney care have been able to achieve. And then maybe in finishing, talk around what we all can do to ensure that we don't fall victim to the problems of kidney failure and what we expect that our nation should also do to ensure that we care for the vulnerable and prepare for the unexpected. So in starting, I mean, World Kidney Day has been celebrated now for close to 20 years. And it started off as a joint initiative of the International Society of Nephrology and the International Federation of Kidney Foundations. It's usually celebrated on the second Thursday in March every year. And the mission of setting up the day is just to raise awareness of how important your kidneys are and how they are important to the overall health of, your, of your, you and yourself meaning that if the kidneys don't function properly, it affects every part of the body. And then also, you know, make reference to the fact that it's quite frequent and it's associated with several health problems that are prevalent in our society today. So over the years, they've chosen several topics to focus on different aspects of kidney care. So we've looked at acute kidney injury, we've looked at chronic kidney injury, we've looked at kidney disease in children, in the obese, we look at it in women. This year, however, we've decided to focus on the unexpected and the vulnerable. And I'm sure we all should know why the international federations decided to focus on this aspect, given that in the last couple of years, quite a number of unexpected pandemic situations have besought us as a people. So the significant impact of these disastrous events, whether they are local events like earthquakes, floods, extremes of weather, or they're global like the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that as a whole, it affects everybody, but more so those we know are vulnerable, particularly our patients that have kidney disease. Take COVID-19, I think that's one that is quite topical. We, knew, we know that during the course of the pandemic, patients with kidney problems were 
probably the most vulnerable of the, of the lot. They had an increased risk of, of infection, sometimes five to 20 times more than the average person in the population. We knew that when they did develop kidney failure, they were more likely to have the severe symptoms. We knew that the likelihood of them dying also was about 16 to 32% more than the average person and about one to two times more likely to be admitted than those who did not have kidney problems. And then when you looked at individuals with kidney failure and looked at age matched persons in the community, you found that those who had kidney failure and were between 20 and 39 were 432 times more likely to die than those who didn't have chronic kidney disease. Those who are between 40 to 59 were 90, almost 100 times more likely. And those who are greater than 80 were more than 10 times likely. So we knew that patients with chronic kidney disease were quite particularly vulnerable during the time of the pandemic. This just speaks to that. If you look at this slide, it's a busy slide, but these are looking at the risk of death in different mm -hmm. groups. So even looking at patients with cancer, be they solid cancers or blood cancers like leukemias, and you compare them with patients who had chronic kidney disease, you find that patients who had transplants or chronic kidney disease were ever more likely to die during the COVID pandemic than any other group. So clearly, chronic kidney disease patients can be termed as being vulnerable during such you know, pandemics. That would speak to the Turkish earthquake which is something else that is quite topical as it happened quite recently. And we know that quite a number of people died, but you found that patients with kidney failure particularly were vulnerable during that period. And several patients who were on dialysis because of the disruption of dialysis during that period had to be moved to other <laughs> likely to have been able to access care for their kidney failure. Coming close to home, I mean, we at St. Nicholas actually did run an isolation unit during the pandemic. And it was clear that our patients who had kidney problems were certainly a lot more vulnerable than others. We found the peak age of our patients then was quite elderly. There were more men than women. But we found that the most frequent risk factor for those we saw and had to admit was the presence of chronic kidney disease, which occurred in about 26% of such patients. 10 of those patients were already patients with end-stage renal disease who were already on dialysis. And then of those who didn't have any kidney problems, four of them developed kidney problems during the course of their care, during the course of their being treated for COVID-19. And quite a number of the mortalities also were patients who had kidney issues. Then who are the vulnerable in our society? We know that there are quite a few vulnerable people in Nigeria as we speak. And we know that our capacity to be able to provide care depending on quite a number of fa factors. Where in the country you live, whether you live in an urban area, a rural area, and depending on how wealthy you are, and then, of course, we're talking of International Women's Day yesterday. We know that clearly women are more vulnerable than men in several respects. But the one I'm speaking to here is the fact that when we look at our patients who access care for dialysis, the ratio of men to women is always almost two to three times more. And some people believe that the... the um, prevalence of the disease actually is almost equal. But you find in our society, there's always a tendency for us to care more for the men than for the women. And that reflects also in the numbers of patients that we see both on dialysis and transplant, because families are more likely to want to spend on the men than the women. And just speaking to what I said earlier, this is looking at statistics in Nigeria as it is, and you find that the wealthier you are, the better, your access to care, either for any of these factors that we have mentioned. Of course, urban areas have better health care than the rural areas. 
And depending on what part of the country you are, you find that the southwest part of the country always has better statistics and the worst is always somewhere up in the north. Now, speaking to chronic kidney disease itself, we know this is a global pandemic as it is. And estimates are that over 850 million people worldwide have kidney failure. The total population of the world is about eight, between eight and nine billion now. So we're talking about at least 10% of the population have one stage of kidney failure or the other. I know, and we know that this is a burden in several respects burden to try and detect it and burden to try and treat. And we know that those of us who live in the developing countries always tend to have even greater burden, aside from the fact that the diseases that lead onto it are more common, they're less often detected early, and our capacity to treat them also is always a challenge. So it's believed that the statistics are probably worse off in the developing countries, inclusive of Nigeria, than in other parts. And we know that this is a significant economic burden, not just on individuals, but also on the nation as a whole. So this slide speaks to the estimates in different parts of the country. So all studies that have been done have consistently shown that between 10 to 16% of adults in any community have one stage of chronic kidney disease or the other. And it's not too far-fetched to see what the consequences of that are. So we find that chronic kidney disease is actually the 12th leading cause of death worldwide. It's more common as a cause of death than TB, than HIV and malaria. And these are three illnesses, communicable illnesses that there seem to be so much fuss about. But CKD, chronic kidney disease, is sadly something that leads more often to death. And we believe that more attention also should be paid to individuals who have this illness. It's the sixth fastest growing cause of death, grown faster than almost any other cause. And it's estimated that by 2040, it's probably going to be the fifth most common cause of death in our environment. And we know that about a third of the world's population, that's one out of every three of us, stand at an increased risk of developing it either because we have hypertension, we have diabetes, we are obese, we smoke. We're becoming elderly. We know our kidney function declines as we grow older. Or we have other illnesses. We've had a stroke, we've had heart attack. Or because there's a family history of kidney problems. Or because we belong to a high-risk ethnic group. And I'll be speaking to that slightly later so that you understand the implications of that for us, for those of us in this part of Africa. <laughs> Worldwide statistics, one in 10 have kidney failure. You are more likely to get it the elderly, the more elderly you are. So about 50% of people who aged over 75. And you find that <laughs> one in four women between the ages of 65 and 74 also have chronic kidney disease. So these are frightening statistics. And if you look at this, the situation in, in the United States of America, you find that it's the eighth leading cause of death in the United States as we speak. And it's estimated that there are over 100,000 people on dialysis in America. But the frightening part of that is that more than 50% of them, even in a resource-rich country like the United States of America, half of the patients on dialysis will be dead within five years, despite the care that they get, care is, is um, provided for by government. And you find that the cost of care to the United States government is over $130 billion. I'm sure this is more than what our own total budget is as a nation, but this is in dollars. And just over 50 billion of that is spent just looking after patients with chronic, with kidney failure alone. Statistics from my own part of the world. I said here that 50% of their patients are dead within five years. These are statistics from one of the teaching hospitals up in uh, the Southwest part of our country. And you find that only 38% of their patients survived more than three months. 90% of their patients who were offered conservative treatment were dead within two weeks. 
And overall, 87% of their patients died within one month. So we said 50% of patients in the US died within five years, and we thought that was bad. But in our own community, almost 90% of them are died, died within one month, particularly in the hinterland where access to care is either not available or unaffordable. And that is what the topic today is speaking to. How do we care for these vulnerable people? How do we prepare for the unexpected? So what are the statistics? I mean, in Africa as it is, about 14% of the population from studies that have been shown have chronic kidney disease. That's almost one out of every five persons. The things that lead on to kidney failure in our environments, we've spoken to these time and time again, but it's an opportunity to re-emphasize some of them. So hypertension, hypertension is very common. We now estimate that by the time you're over 60, over 50 to 60% of individuals would have hypertension. Fortunately, majority of those who have hypertension are not aware. Majority of those who are aware cannot afford treatment. And even when they afford treatment, you find that many of them are not well controlled. So hypertension is certainly one of the more common things lead on to kidney failure in our environment. Diabetes 25 years ago was only about 2.2% of the population. More recent statistics are closer to 10%. So almost one out of every 10 of us have elevated blood sugar. And majority of those who have, don't know, 50% of those who have diabetes are not aware because they're not symptomatic enough. And the fact that you're not on treatment doesn't mean you're not vulnerable to the risks of kidney failure as a consequence. Then of course, chronic glomerulonephritis. Chronic glomerulonephritis follows up on chronic infections, usually in our environment. So things like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. Between, I mean, it's not it's about three to four percent of our population. Yeah, is about ten percent. Hepatitis is about three to four percent of the population. We know sickle cell disease is common in our environment. It's probably one of the where the country with the highest burden of sickle cell disease in the world because of the very high percentages of patients that have it, and because of our very large population. And then. Things that cause obstruction to flow of urine. So fibroids in women, prostate in men, stones, all these are things that have the potential to cause your kidneys to fail. Then, of course, our use of toxic medications, our use of herbs, our use of agbo, agomo, and all these herbal supplements that different people market under herbal supplements. I was listening to the radio yesterday and openly. Uh, somebody preaching the use of alternate medicine, some very Asian sounding person. I was shocked that even in Nigeria, someone can leave wherever they are to come and market herbal medications here in Nigeria. Then, of course, I use of bleaching creams. I don't see why we need to do that. These were banned several years ago, but they're back with us. Uh, God created us beautiful and we should remain black and beautiful as we are. But I'll speak to a few of these as we go on. So the other factors, so the bigger you are, the greater the chance that your kidneys will be vulnerable if you have any illness that might predispose you to it. So if you have hypertension and diabetes, one of the things the doctors will emphasize is the need for you to lose weight. But if you look at this chart, the bigger you are, depending on what you call your body mass index, the greater the likelihood that you'll have protein in the urine, which is one of the earliest markers of damage to the kidneys. And of course, the habits that we generally tend to take on. So if you smoke, the risk, the more you smoke, the greater the risk of protein in the urine. As I said, that is a marker for kidney disease. The more you drink, the greater the likelihood that you'll end up with kidney failure. And strangely enough, the more protein that you take, fortunate for us in our environment, we don't eat that much protein. We're not like in Kenya, for instance, who can eat a kilo of steak. Most times you just take one or two or three pieces of small meat or chicken or fish with your meals, maybe more for economic reasons. 
So maybe that's what may have protected us somewhat. And then the use and abuse of analgesics. Many of us just go to the chemists and ask for, some people call it Tashakmo. After it's heavy day at work, the taxi driver gets home, he's tired, goes to the chemist and says, give me a sharp one. Two tablets of paracetamol, two of ibuprofen, two of caffeinol, and mixes it all together and takes. I can tell you that even paracetamol is not completely safe. And I can tell you, if you use two tablets of paracetamol three times a day and you do so for two years, you're risking a situation where your kidneys would become vulnerable. But sadly, you should avoid the non-steroidal drugs, your ibuprofen, diclofenac, if you already are vulnerable, if you already have diabetes or hypertension, or they've told you that you have kidney failure or you've had a transplant, please do not use any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs if you do have pain. And this slide just shows you what the normal kidney looks like. And what the kidney in someone who has, who has abused analgesics looks like. So statistics from our own center in a year, I think this must have been 2019, I think, where we saw a close to about 100 patients. We found that chronic glomerular nephritis was the commonest cause, then hypertension, then of course diabetes coming shortly after that. But there are a few other things that one needs to speak to. And one of that is the fact that we in this part of the world are particularly vulnerable. We know that diabetes is increasing, hypertension is increasing. We know the older you are, the greater the likelihood. We know that men slightly more than women, but genetics, which is determined by your ethnicity and your race, is also a very strong factor. And if you look at nations of the world where you have a mixed population. You find that the Blacks in such communities always have an exceedingly higher risk than any other population. So if you look in the United States, the Blacks are four times more than white people to develop kidney failure. So you find that even though they're only about 15% of the population in America, they represent almost 30 to 40% of patients that are on dialysis in all the centers in America. And it's the same in the UK where you find that whites, some people might say it has something to do with access, the fact that they're more likely to be better in doubt. But that aside, in studies that have looked at equally endowed persons of both ethnicities, you find that blacks are more likely to develop kidney failure than white people. And we believe, so like I said, I mean, the reasons might be poverty, ignorance, illiteracy, Poor access to healthcare. I mean, these are all factors. The fact that the child is more likely to have been born with impaired intrauterine growth retardation. But you find that possibly the most significant reason is the inheritance of this gene, which you call the apo lipoprotein 1 gene. And studies are increasingly showing, showing that those who have, are that vulnerable, the vulnerability is because they've inherited this gene. And if you look at the predominance of where that gene exists, it's actually on the west coast of Africa, including Nigeria. Several studies have shown that we generally tend to have much higher than even other parts of Africa. And this slide speaks to that. You find if you compare the East Europeans, almost none of them have inherited this aprolipoprotein 1 gene. So probably that's why the prevalence of kidney failure amongst them is that low. Yeah. If you look at the African-Americans, these are people who came predominantly from the West Coast of Africa. You find that the prevalence of the gene is about 10 to 15%. But if you look at us in West Africa, easily 46% of us have either the G1, G1 or the G2, G2, or we're carriers. So by the time you add the 46 here to 96 here, up to 46 here, we have over 92% of us either manifesting with the homozygous state of carrying the gene or carrying the gene and having the capacity to be able to pass it on to our children. So it's not in any way surprising. And when you look at this next slide and you look at the prevalence of burden of chronic kidney disease in Africa, you find that people 
in the northern part of the continent, which are mainly in the migrants, who are mainly Arabs, only 4% of them have kidney problems. In East Africa, 11%. In South Africa, 12%. In Central Africa, which is close to us, 16%. But in the western part of Africa, 17% of us have the kidney disease in this environment. So it's clearly certain that we are the most vulnerable, or the most likely, and the likely cause is related to our inheritance of this apolipotein 1G. But there are a few other things which I'll speak to very quickly, because there are certain persons who come in and investigate them. They don't have hypertension. They don't have diabetes. They haven't had any chronic infections. They're, they're not sicklers. They have no obstruction, and yet they have kidney failure. So we call these people people who have chronic kidney disease of uncertain or undetermined origin. And it's been on, not just here in Africa, but they've seen it in South America, they've seen it also in, in South Asia. And they've linked it to toxins, heavy metals, and herbs, all of which are predominant in our environment, as you see as we go on. It's also believed to be due to multiple hits. Hypertension is common. Diabetes is becoming more common. It's exposed to heat and doesn't take enough water. So heat stress, low socioeconomic status, and genetic predisposition, amongst other things, are the things that we believe that are responsible for this chronic kidney disease of undetermined origin. We know that the world's temperature is, is global warming that we're talking about. And if you look at the temperature of the world over the last about 140 years or thereabouts, you find that increasingly the temperature has risen by almost one degree. And the consequence of that, of course, is that there's a lot of heat. The, the rivers are drying up, the lakes, you know what has happened to Lake Chad quite recently and not enough water is being taken by such individuals. And then coupled with the fact that we now tend to not look after our, our environment properly. So if you look at the top 10 countries with unhealthy air quality, it starts with Bangladesh, there's Pakistan, India, but right at number 10 is our dear country, Nigeria. And if you look at the 20 worst cities with air pollution, of the 20 listed in the world, Four of those cities are in Nigeria. So you have Onita, you have Kaduna, you have Aba, and you have Umahia. Amongst the 20, 20 cities in the world that have the worst air pollution. And then of course we know what has happened to our environment, particularly in the south-south part of the country, where a lot of them have been, the environment has been degraded from attempts to, to um, exploit such countries. There are people that are refining of uh, petrol products. You, know, you can imagine this guy, how much exposure he has to you know, the effects of you know, the toxins contained in the organochemicals that are in what he's trying to refine. And studies have shown that the solvent-related end-stage renal disease occurs, particularly for those who are engaged in occupations where they're exposed to such solvents. And such solvents include petroleum products, ketones, xylene. And we know that in the presence of glomerulopathies or kidney-related diseases, progression to kidney failure is very common. And then something else that I find interesting, this is for our women. I'm not saying it is for you to celebrate your International Women's Day, but we know that the average woman wears about 515 chemicals on the average in a day. So either what you use to wash your hands or you use to line your eyes and other things, all these things contain chemicals and not all of them are safe. And you find that the risk for you to develop diseases related to your kidney and sometimes your liver is also quite high. A lot of the bleaching creams that are used contain a lot of mercury, they contain a lot of steroids. The steroids generally tend to repress your immunity. 
make it difficult for your skin to heal when you go through surgeries. So these are things that I think we as individuals can do to ensure that we reduce our own risk of developing kidney failure. Statistics in Nigeria, different studies have been done. Last year in our group found um, chronic kidney disease in about 12%. Wankwa in Maiduguri found almost 18%. So the numbers generally are higher than we find in other communities in the world. And we know that despite the fact that these, you know, the kidney failure is common in our environment, our capacity to be able to provide care is limited. So even though 60% of the world live, or 17% live in sub-Saharan Africa, only about one of the people on dialysis worldwide are on dialysis here in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, the top nations would be, of course, US, Japan, and the European Union. What are we more likely to do? We're more likely to go to Dr. Juma, the local herbal doctor, who gives the same herbs for insanity, for diarrhea, does for when you have a swollen body, which quite likely might be kidney failure. Uh, herbalists have become quite uh, internet savvy. So you can see this herbalist with his divining pot, but also has a computer there. Uh, prophets who have prices for everything, for you know, healing and other things, but always at a price. And then the quality of some of our hospitals in different parts of the rural areas, particularly. I mean, in this hospital, if you go there, you're more likely to develop something that you didn't come up, come to, come there with. And then you become so vulnerable. The, fact, the radio program I was listening to earlier yesterday, obviously either from China or Korea or somewhere, was, was on radio openly marketing herbal medications for treatment of alternate medicine. We now have all kinds of hospitals being run by non-Nigerians. And I can tell you that they're not necessarily more likely to treat you any better than the Nigerian doctor is likely to. And what do we do? We tend to pray. Yeah, you should pray, but you know, even the Bible tells you that you should, you know, prayer without work comes to nothing. So you find that if you compare us with different parts of the world, Nigeria is a single country that has the highest number of people who pray every day. 95% of us pray every day. Whilst in places like China, only about 1%. Even in the US, 55%. In the UK, only 6% pray every day. They're more likely to...
Yes. Hello. So please, I'll ask that you bear with us. I think it's um network. So we just hold on for some text. Thank you. Is there a route through here? Yes. Star the block is star post. All right, please um, bear with us. We are getting this resolved. Dr. Bambo is still here and he's going to join us shortly. Thank you.
Well, I hope I'm back with everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes sir. We can hear you. Okay. I sincerely apologize for that, but we had a glitch with our internet. We can hear you, sir. Okay. So I was, before we were quite rudely interrupted, I was telling you about the uh, capacity being rather impaired in our country, Nigeria today. And yet, despite that, we know that kidney failure is pretty common. We know that international estimates suggest that there are about 100 per million population of our people require kidney care. About 100 per million develop kidney failure every single year. So if you estimate our population as being about 20, 10 million. Don't get involved, I agree. I think everyone needs to mute, please. If you're, if you're not on, please mute. About 21,000 new cases are diagnosed every year. And if you add those to people who had been on dialysis before or had end-stage renal disease before, it should really be about 465 per million population, which would mean almost 100,000 people should be on kidney failure care every single year. But if you put the total number of individuals currently on care in Nigeria, either transplants, dialysis, either peritoneal or hemodialysis, I can tell you authoritatively that there are less than 5,000. So if 21,000 or more likely 100,000 require it and only 5,000 are getting it, you can imagine what's happening to those who are not getting it. And that's why you'll find that, you know, I believe quite strongly that kidney failure is one of the most common causes of quality in our dear country, Nigeria, today. And if we are going to be estimating how much we would require to care for these patients, you know, I told you that the US has spent about $50 billion per year. I think we would estimate that you probably would need about 316 billion naira to adequately care for these patients. But how many nephrologists do we have? If we compare ourselves with other continents, in hmm. Europe, they have about 31 nephrologists for every million of their population. We in hmm. Africa, just one. Hmm. You might argue that you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have the highest number of nephrologists. And currently, the estimates are that we have about 230 nephrologists all around the country. But what are you finding? Many of them are leaving. This was a, a paper we wrote, you know, for, you know, in a book looking at uh, nephrology in different parts of the world. And we put together what the situation was for, for, for Nigeria. You find that when you look in the US, in the United States, and you look at all the nephrologists who trained outside of the US, for those that come from Africa, Nigeria has the highest number. They have almost half the number that are currently, over half the number that are currently in Nigeria are licensed and practicing in, in the country, much more than any other African country, including Egypt. And Egypt has well over almost a thousand nephrologists. We have only 230. Egypt's population is about 100 million. We have 210 million, and we have only 100 and we have only 230, out of which 124 have jackpot and are currently practicing in the United States. Add to that the, the number that have gone to the UK, that have gone to South Africa, that have gone to Australia, that have gone to the Middle East. It's not surprising that our capacity to be able to provide care is limited. Yes. We have over the years developed the capacity to look after patients. So we have, we have peritoneal dialysis available since 1966. We have over 188 dialysis units all around the country, many of them in public hospitals, an increasingly greater number also in private hospitals. And like I said, about 230 trained and actively practicing nephrologists in the country. Currently, there are about 15 units that have the capacity to do kidney transplants. But if you look at the distribution, 
if you look at the six geopolitical zones, you find that Southwest has 62, and the whole of the northeastern part of our country have only 10. Even though we know that kidney failure is a major problem, we don't have enough people, the centers are few and far between, most of those centers are in the urban areas, which makes our people who live in the rural areas quite vulnerable. Most of the units are small, many of them not well run, and maintenance is very poor. And many of our patients, unfortunately, present late. Most of them at the point where we're even finding out that they have kidney failure is at the point where they actually do need dialysis. We haven't detected them early at the point where care okay. retard okay. progression. And so it's Definitely. that outcomes are poor. Don't know about those patients are not surviving up to a year. They're talking about kidney transplant. Uh, sorry, can, can we mute, please? It's looking at, you know, the distribution of those resources that we have. This is units of nephrologists in different parts of our country. So the Southwest probably has the best statistics. Finally, the Southeast has the worst. But Lagos and Abuja are differentially much better subserved than any other part of the country. And there's a burden of these therapies. Yes, they exist. But you find that on average, um, you find that you know dialysis costs roughly about 150,000 naira if you're going to do it properly, three sessions per week. Each session will probably be about 50,000 naira by the time you factor in the cost of dialysis, the cost of investigations, the cost of drugs, particularly the erythropoietin and iron that you're required to give. And easily you'll be spending upwards of almost 9 million naira just sustaining dialysis. Transplant is not cheap. And the price has progressively gone up because a lot of the medications that we need are imported, particularly the tests and some of the induction agents. So you find that you need between 10 and 15 million these days to carry out a transplant and maintain yourself even within the first year. And the cost of medications after are also not cheap. But we know that transplants, when you're looking at individuals who end up in end-stage renal disease, and you look at the options for treatment, conservative treatments, peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and transplant. Transplant is the best. It gives you the best quality of life. It reduces the risk of dying. And really, in our setting, it's probably the most viable option for our patients. And you think cost savings are already at the end of the, of, the, um, first, of the second year. And you find that the risk of dying and using the graph is better the shorter the time that you spend on dialysis. And just to reflect that, this is a busy slide, but I'll try and explain it very quickly. The yellow line are patients in the general population. The green line are patients who've had transplants. And the red or brown line are those who are on dialysis. And the horizontal axis are those different age groups. So between 0 to 19, 20 to 24, up to 75 to 79. While the vertical axis are the number of years you expect such individuals to still live. So if you're about 20 years, we expect that if you're in the general population, and this is in Europe, these are not statistics from Nigeria you still live another almost 70 years and beyond at age 20. Now, if you're on dialysis, it brings you down here, but transplant takes you up much closer to what occurs in the general population. So if you interpret this, if you're 20 and you're on dialysis, you have the same remaining lifetime as an individual who is 75 in the general population. Of course, as you can see, women always outlive the men in whatever of the categories that you belong to. So maybe that's God's gift for you on International Women's Day. And if you look at individuals who remain on dialysis and individuals who have a transplant and you follow them up over 1,801 days, which is five years, you find that the risk of dying is half 
if you have a transplant and if you remain on dialysis. And these are, this is even in environments where they have the capacity to be able to support you properly. And these are even with cadaveric transplants and not with live donor transplants. And this just shows that the earlier that you do the transplant, the better. So if you do the transplant preemptively before you need oh, this, compare that with whether you do it after six years, two years. You find if you follow such individuals up over 10 years, 120 months, the shorter the time you spent on dialysis, the greater the likelihood that the kidneys will still be functional. So if you do it preemptively at 10 years, over 80% of those who do transplants still have their kidneys. Whilst at two years, only about 50% of them do. And then it's safe for people, living donors, to donate their kidneys. I always slot this in to encourage those individuals who want to donate to their relatives, which is the appropriate thing to do. You find that if you follow up donors over 25 years and you compare them with age and sex matched controls in the population, individuals who donated survive longer than those who didn't. And some people may ask why. Some say because they're more careful, you come to hospital, you care for them and all that. Maybe God recompenses them, all that might be true. But the real reason is that before we accept you as a donor, we check you from your head to your toe. And we only accept you if we think that you are healthy. And by your being accepted as a donor, you're already a healthier person than the average person in the community. And your risk of dying is much less than a person in the general population. And by your going ahead to donate a kidney, that your advantage that you have for long life is not in any way shortened. And then in terms of cost of care, also I think this, uh, this is data from the United States. The most expensive. Peritoneal dialysis comes next. And transplant is a lot cheaper than any of the other two modalities of the long term. So what has the situation been with transplant in Africa? Uh, about eight countries now on the continent do carry out transplants in sub-Saharan Africa. We find that Nigeria is on that map and doing much better than we did in the past. Uh, South Africa probably has the best statistics and they do roughly about two to 300 per, per year with a population of about 40 to 50 million. In Nigeria now, we do about roughly about 200 transplants every single year. So these are the countries that have the capacity to do transplants. And when they actually developed that capacity, and proudly Nigeria is on that map. Um, and as you might know, you know, St. Nicholas Hospital pioneered kidney transplants in the year 2000, and these are the lists of units all, all around our country who do transplants and when they started to. And we started off transplants in the year 2000 and have been doing it consistently since then. And these are the numbers that have been done by the different units. Many of the units are not active. Most of the units that are active are actually based in the private hospitals. But as with all things, you find that the capacity is also skewed. And the best capacities for transplants are in the southwest part of the country, where six hospitals in that unit, in that geopolitical zone, have at one time or the other done transplants. Whilst in all the other geopolitical zones, there's been only been one unit, southwest, that's Anu, and northeast, that's Maiduguri, north central, that's Lori, south south, that's Ogara. In Southeast, that's in Mwahe. Uh, of course, Lagos and Abuja have the highest capacities. That just reflects the situation on the map. We know that the private units generally tend to be the more successful ones. And clearly, you know, over 90% of the transplants have been done in two privately run transplant units. Uh, we know that the centers are more likely to be in the urban areas. So what happens to our population in the rural areas, mainly in places that there's economic endowment. So you find that Lagos, Abuja, Kano, 
and the centers that are more likely to have active centers. And these are the factors that determine how well those centers do. We know that there are challenges with the typical public health institution, poor maintenance quality, or poor work ethic, empathy to their patients is. But more importantly, all these strikes and work to rule. So you have the patient on dialysis and then the hospital is on strike. So what happens to your patients? They have to scurry around and look for all other places to go and do their dialysis. So we've done over or close to 1,500. All the transplants around the country now have been live donors. And we do a mixture of both open and laparoscopic uh, removals of the kidney. There's some concern about commercial kidney donations. But this is mainly for patients traveling outside the country. But I'll speak to that a bit later. What has been our experience in St. Nicholas since we set up the units in 1998? And these are the number of patients that we've had to manage every single year. Last year, we've managed 200 patients. Uh, these are the oldest patient was 85, youngest was about seven. The mean age was quite a number of them were diabetics, seem to be managing their anemia quite well. Like I said earlier, there are more men than women, and I don't think that's because kidney failure is more common in men than women. Even if it is, it's just a very slightly greater number. It's because I think the nature of our environment, we are more likely to support the woman, the men than the woman when it comes to the cost for an expensive endeavor like dialysis. Transplants, we've been doing transplants since the year 2000, that's over 2000, 23 years now. Uh, we've linked up with different units in different parts in the UK yes, and India. Uh, the first one was done exactly 23 years ago two days ago, that was on the 6th of March. That was the date we did the first transplant. So far, we've done well over 300, almost 400 transplants. We've done from a range of 11 to almost 70 years. Uh, the mean age has been about 45 years. The ratio is even greater in favor of men than women. And these are the number of transplants we've done since inception. So last year we did almost 50. And the numbers just keep increasing, okay? This dip here was the year of COVID when all units around the world had to suspend their transplant. And like I said, slightly more skewed towards the male than the female. So you find that this is even worse. The disparity is even greater amongst transplants, which is more expensive than the routine daily dialysis that patients need to pay for. So we need to look in women clearly and now be time to be, to some extent, somewhat uh, vulnerable. We need to have measures in place to be able to protect such individuals. The transplants, these are their ages, causes, hypertension, glomerulonephritis, and diabetes. Um, the donors, you can't take a donor younger than 18, and generally you shouldn't take one over, that, over 70 years, so they've ranged generally tend to be slightly younger. And you'll find, this is something I find also very interesting in the sense that yes, this unit is based in the Southwest part of the country. So naturally you have the greatest number, but despite it, you find if you add the South, South and Southeast, the numbers outstrip those in the Southwest part of the country. And I think to some extent it's because of the inheritance of that apple lipoprotein one gene I spoke about earlier. I said, we in West Africa have the highest prevalence of that gene. Now, when studies have been done in Nigeria, looking at the inheritance of that gene, depending on which part of the country you have come from, we find that the highest prevalence of that gene is in the South East and South South part of the country, much higher than in the Southwest. So I think that is a major factor determining why kidney failure seems to be slightly more common amongst people from the South, South and South East part of the country. In terms of the relationship between our donors, we're quite strict in ensuring that we don't take commercial donors. And most of them have been relatives, um, 
one way or the other. And we generally tend to want to do the removal of the kidneys laparoscopically because it causes less pain for the donor. If the donor stays much shorter time and the risk of complications are fewer. This is someone who donated. This is just after, um, this is the day after he donated. Uh, many of our patients still go abroad, unfortunately. But many of those who go abroad are those we rejected because they've come with a donor that we think is not, is a commercial donor. And um, many of them go, I mean, in the early days, then he went to Pakistan and they came back with very poor statistics. But as a nation, we must recognize that the WHO, the Transplant Society and International Society have said we should take measures to protect the poorest and vulnerable groups from transplant tourism. Because who are the people that are more likely to be approached to sell their kidneys? They're those who are poor, who are willing to sell their kidney for the cost of an iPhone or a new, new clothing and things. So we should try to make sure that there are measures in place to protect these vulnerable people. Because they'll spend that money, they've lost a kidney, and there have been instances in Pakistan where such individuals have gone back to want to donate their second kidney. So there's this Istanbul Declaration that met about 15 years ago. And if you look there, I happen to have been one of about 100 people around the world selected to put that Istanbul Declaration together, encouraging us people from wanting to sell their kidneys. It's quite safe for relatives to do so. And that's why I, in the earlier part of the talk, I had shared how safe it is, how donors are more likely to live even longer than non-donors in the environment. Fortunately, now we have the Nigerian Health Act, which criminalizes people selling their body parts. But the problem is that the fine is what, one million? Maybe what happens is that the person just adds the one million to the cost that he's asking for, knowing fully well that you know the penalty is not steep enough. And the Nigerian Association of Nephrology is trying to encourage governments to make the penalty stricter. I know that Lagos State is in the process of enacting a law, which I hope when it comes to, to play or to comes into into active, you know, becomes active. Discourage, you know, people wanting to sell their kidneys. What we try to do is to try and start off a disease donor transplant program. That is not yet available in the country, but that takes special legislation to allow the harvesting of kidneys from dead people, but also measures to make sure that people don't go and kidnap somebody kill him to remove his kidney. So these are things that we need to make sure are in place before we can you know, um, safely ensure that we start off a program. There are various challenges to kidney transplants in Africa and costs are a major issue. But what are the solutions? I think we must first as a country accept that we must provide universal healthcare as a fundamental human right that every citizen of this country should be entitled to care, whether for malaria or diarrhea or pregnancy or kidney failure. And whatever it is, it must include access to renal supportive care. It's not a matter of if we should do it, it is how we're going to do it and when. And one hopes that whatever government comes into play over the next six months will be someone who would focus on measures to make sure that this can happen. And then we should have the capacity to deal with the full range of what is required to provide care. We don't do enough peritoneal dialysis, which generally is slightly cheaper than hemodialysis. We should have capacity to do therapeutic arthritis. We in St. Nicholas have had that capacity for close to five years now. And it has been a very strong factor supporting our transplant program. We should be able to deal with stones by lithotripsy. We should be able to do transplants all around the country competently, efficiently, and cost-effectively. And we should provide these at costs that are affordable at locations within the reach of all, both in the urban and the rural areas. And the government should provide that care for the less privileged, either by subsidizing or completely funding that care. 
And when it now becomes more widely available, it's believed that clearly the costs of providing whatever form of care, be it dialysis or transplant, will eventually come down. We should also look at alternatives or alternative technologies or look at technology, how we can use it to reduce costs and make it more av available and affordable. We should adapt and modify and not necessarily say this is how we do it abroad. We should look, it might mean, you know, looking at the possibility of manufacturing some of these um, software or consumables locally and negotiate deals with providers of technology. That's what India does. You find that India is able to provide the costs of medications and consumables at about half of what we're able to because of their population. We also have a large population. So government should stop adding the costs of, uh, you know, import levies and, and, and inspection levies and all sorts of levies that naturally increase the cost of providing. And then we should look at screening and early diagnosis. Even in the US that have that very wide capacity, they are also finding that $50 billion every year just looking after kidney failure is beyond what they can afford. So it's important that we start screening and early diagnosis. Over 84% of our patients, by the time we're diagnosing them, they're already at the point where they need dialysis. If we cut them in stage one or stage two, rather than in stage five, clearly we would have been able to put in measures to reverse or at least slow down progression and not wait until the stage where they now need dialysis and they can't afford. So we should look at prevention, you know, you know, controlling blood pressure, controlling blood sugar, avoiding the use of native herbs, avoiding the abuse of um, non-steroidal strong analgesics, and realize that no government anywhere in the world can provide care for all. And then we must, government must ensure that the National Health Insurance Agency must be able to help and include dialysis and transplantation as one of the things that they're able to provide. As to what we should do, each time you go into hospital, make sure that your blood pressure is checked. Make sure that at least once a year, if you don't already have protein in the urine, somebody checks your urine to make sure you don't have protein in it. Protein in the urine is one of the earliest markers of damage to your kidneys. And one of the ways of noting it is if you pass urine, you find that the urine foams and you attempt to flush and urine and the foam stays. So if you see that, please go to the doctor and let them examine you and be certain that you don't have protein in the urine and you don't have kidney failure. And who should be screened? All people with hypertension, all people who've had strokes or heart attack, if you have HIV, anybody over the age of 60 who is having recurrent symptoms of any sort, please go and let somebody check and make sure your kidneys are fine. Women are lucky because in pregnancy, they invariably would have blood pressure checks and urine tests. And suddenly, if you have a raised blood pressure, that person should be checked for kidney. And if you have a family or personal history of kidney disease, then those are people that should regularly have screening and checks to make sure that they're fine. What are the things to do? Should try and keep fit and active, get up, walk. Make sure that your blood pressure and blood sugar is monitored and controlled. Eat the right things that will keep your weight under check and will not put pressure on your kidneys. Don't take too much salt. Make sure you take enough water. Make sure that you don't take less than 1.5 to 2 liters of water in a day. Don't smoke. As you saw earlier, smoking definitely has a negative impact on your kidney function. Don't take over-the-counter medications and get your kidney function checked if you have any of the conditions that we have mentioned earlier. So in conclusion, when we're preparing for the unexpected, it's important more so for our patients with kidney because once there's disruption, once there's a riot, once there's a pandemic and there's a stay home order, you can stay home and all you have to worry about is, how will I get food? 
The patient that has kidney failure and has to go for dialysis has to leave his house and go to the hospital. So we have to be able to ensure that we have policies in place to make sure that we can provide care for such persons. And it's nice that those who are vulnerable should prepare, should have an emergency kit that ensures that they have enough of their drugs. So now that we have elections coming, one prays that everything is, goes well and there no, there's no disruption. This is a time that those particularly transplant patients make sure that you have enough stock of your drugs so that there's no disruption to your care. And I always feel pleased to display this picture of um, one of our oldest surviving transplants. She did the transplant 22 years ago, and her husband, who you see in the picture, was the one who donated the kidney to her, They're both alive and well. Thank you very much, and I'll take your questions if you have any. Ifoma, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for that. In fact, I'm always very happy to see that very concluding part where the couples are like all happy. So they are 22 years now after um, transplant. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's um, amazing. More years to them. But... So um, this is a... I just want to apologize for the leak we had earlier. And um, please, if you have questions, okay, I'm sure I can be heard now. So please, if you have questions, can you please um, write in the chat or you can put up your hands, you can raise your hands, you can use the raise hand up option and then we'll take it one after the other. So it's we already have a question in the chat. Are you for real? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, former. Thank you for that. Give me what I want. Well, seems to have dropped off, so I will take over. I can see, I don't know who iPhone is, your hand is up. Yeah. Uh, Mute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. And may I ask that everyone who is not speaking to please mute themselves. They're not speaking. And Sandra, please mute yourself. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Hello. Maybe I can be heard now. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, please. I apologize again about that. It has to do with the network, but that has been resolved. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, please, if you have questions, put it in the chat and then we'll take it from there. If not, we can also take verbal questions and you would have to signify by using the hand sign. So please, um, sir, I have the car, Mohammed. Says the best possible ways to prevent infections. I think he's trying to ask if, what are the best possible ways to prevent infections against- Well, I, I think I'll, I'll take each I don't question. Know, Mr. Yakaka, is that what you're trying to say? I think I'll take each question as it comes. That way it might answer some of the questions that other people might have. So how do you prevent infections? Very easy. You don't expose yourself. More so if you've had a transplant. And I have told uh, very often my uh, patients who've had transplants that unfortunately you are one of those that can never stop to use the mask. Never stop to make sure that you're not exposed to large crowds and not exposed to situations where the risk of infection is high. So if someone's hopping or spluttering near you, that person should keep away from you because almost certainly you would catch it. And if you catch it, 
they're more likely to have a very severe form. It's less likely to be easily treatable. So it's important that we, you, you reduce your exposure, either when you're on dialysis, where your immunity is impaired, or even after you've had a transplant, when you're also on medications that are further lowering that immunity. So just be careful, don't eat carelessly, don't expose yourself unnecessarily. So that should answer the question on the risk of infection. Is the former back? If she's not, I will just- Yes, start. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, this so go to the next question. Yes, so uh, we have other questions. The next question is coming from Paula. She says, for how long will a post-transplant patient go for a checkup? And then, um... unfortunately, you know, I can tell you there's a, an Indian colleague of mine, Dr. Sunda, who says quite, you know, aptly that unfortunately, once you have kidney failure by whatever form, you are married to your nephrologist for life. You never can, either while you're on dialysis, before dialysis, after you've had a transplant you must always maintain a regular check. Of course, the frequency of checks will reduce. Maybe in the first week we're seeing you, in the first month we're seeing you every month, every week. Subsequently, we might see you every month. Subsequently, we might be every two or three months. But even when you have hypertension and diabetes, it's important that you visit your hospital on a regular basis. That is even when you have now developed kidney failure. That's the only way you can be certain that you are controlling your blood pressure and blood sugar appropriately. And that in itself reduces your risk of developing kidney failure. And if you've developed kidney failure, it helps to ensure that you maintain that kidney for as long right. as possible. Hello? Yeah. So never ever reduce the, yeah. the number of visits. Make sure that you're seeing oh, so you're going in there. on a regular basis. <laughs> I live there as well. That's what I'm talking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. If I you need to. Okay. Um, I'm 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 working on that. Sir. Okay. So um, we have more questions, sir, and. This is saying for is it for a stage three A C K D? Does it go back to normal over time? For a stage three A C K D, does it go back to normal over time? And then the other one says, okay. yeah, unfortunately not. You know, by definition, once you have chronic kidney disease, there are two things in that diagnosis: it is progressive and it is irreversible. So once you've developed it. Even the best of care can only slow down progression. You can't arrest it and you can't reverse it. So that's the answer to that question. So you won't go back to normal, but at least you can maintain that level for much longer and hopefully not require dialysis if you're lucky enough. Okay. Okay, so then I have this other question. It says, um, how much of support does the transplant program gets from philanthropists and governments? Not enough. Uh, to be fair to Lagos State government, over the years, I think Lagos State has supported maybe about 15 patients in our own transplant program. Uh, some other governments have also supported them. Foundation supported them. So there are a few philanthropists, but not enough. I don't know. It is there, but um, like I've said, it has over twenty-one thousand people requiring dialysis and transplants every year, and we're doing less than two hundred. Then it just shows that not enough is being done, and many people are succumbing and dying on account of not having access to dialysis and transplantation. Okay. I hope these questions of yours have been answered. If not, please just go ahead and ask for clarity. All right, so um, we have this other one from 
Maureen says, um, good morning. Are there any dietary guidelines to help prevent kidney degradation or failure? For example, are more alkaline diets better? I think that's an interesting question. Mm. And what I always say is that everything in moderation, for me, the key thing, individuals must restrict their weight. As you saw during the course of the talk, the bigger that you are, regardless of whatever it is that's responsible for your kidney failure, the greater the likelihood that your kidneys will fail, the greater the likelihood that you'll have protein in the urine, which is amazing. So the first thing is make sure that you eat in moderation and get your weight down. Don't eat too much salt. Don't take too much protein. And certainly avoid anything that potentially is toxic to the kidneys. So all your agbo, all your agbo, <laughs> all your herbal supplements that many people are want to take, um, even though they're seemingly Swedish bitters, they're made abroad, they're packaged. I can tell you that in Taiwan, the commonest cause of kidney failure is Chinese herbal preparations. So many people develop kidney failure just from that cause alone. And as such, the fact that it's packaged and sold in the chemist does not make it safe. As I always tell people, any drug that is now deemed scientifically to be safe to use will become an orthodox medication. And so all your various herbs that people take, please try and avoid them. So, and then of course, even the orthodox medications, you need to be careful. A lot of us abuse analgesics. Rather than keep taking analgesics, try and determine what is responsible for your pain. Visit your doctor and take them in the right proportion and not for long. You know, those adverts always say, after two or three days, go and see your doctor. Don't just keep abusing medications. We abuse antibiotics, we abuse analgesics, all of which have negative effects. But as to alkaline diets specifically, yes, one of the things that we do is that, you know, um, when you have chronic kidney disease, one of the things that we know that has helped to slow down progression is to try and alkalinize your urine, okay? Uh, but the thing is, a lot of what is purported to be alkaline diet and alkaline water is not necessarily so. There are medical ways of dealing with this, and I'll suggest that you go and see your doctor so that he treats you appropriately. So the next question. Um, the next question is coming from, okay, so he says, uh, why can't people validly sell their kidneys to banks that cater for such in Nigeria when people sell sperms to donor sperm banks in the same, in the same Nigeria? So this very person is good, asking. Okay, very, right. very good question. And I'm glad that somebody asked this. Sperm is, as is female eggs, as is even surrogacy, these are things that leave you without any impediment of any sort. They are very replaceable. Even blood, even though that shouldn't be the case, we all know that people are incentivized to donate blood, but all these are easily replaceable. If you give a part of blood, within two weeks, you replace that blood. You can donate your sperm now, and later this evening, you have another one ready to go. Eggs, a woman releases several eggs during every ovulation cycle. So these are all replaceable parts. If you give a kidney, you've given a part of you, which is not replaceable. And you'll find that the people who are more likely to sell these parts are the vulnerable people. And what statistics have shown are that those who have sold their kidneys, people don't even understand the implications of it. They've sold and that's it, they're gone. Nobody follows up with them to make sure they continue to remain healthy. And very often, 
whatever it was that they sold the kidney to do, within no time at all, they've expended the money. And then they're back in debt. And there have been instances in Pakistan where such people have gone back and wanted to donate to their second kidney. So if we're going to be protecting the vulnerable in our society, the poor, which incidentally features around what the theme for this World Kidney Day is, then we shouldn't encourage the buying of kidneys. We should discourage it. And government should find a way to appropriately, you know, um, correct individuals who might be tempted to want to do so. It's quite safe for relatives to do so. And enough tests are done to ensure that it can be safe for you as an individual to do it without any long-term effects on you. And as I said, donors on the long-term do just as well, if not better than individuals in the community. By going ahead and giving a kidney, in your life, is not in any way shortened. So it's safe if you have a relative genetically or emotionally who requires your kidney, feel, feel confident to go ahead and do it and know that your lifespan will not in any way be impaired. Okay. So, um, there is this other question. Come, we have a lot of questions, uh, so uh, I'll keep taking it. So uh, this person is saying, um, just asking, is it more academically difficult to become a nephrologist than a gynecologist? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just add. This. Okay, yeah, I'll add just the add second question. All right, sir. So, is it, what's your view on new drugs like? Foxiga. 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 Yeah. On okay. Okay. So in terms of how difficult it is to become a nephrologist, yes, I can tell you that um, gynecologists are more likely to be people who want to use their hands. Okay. So I think in terms of didactic component of the training, I would say that that component is probably a little more intense for those who are in the internal medical subspecialties, particularly in nephrology, than for the surgical ones. Um, I'm sure my surgical colleagues might think otherwise. But as regards the use of Foxiga, Foxiga is one of the, what you call the sodium glucose transporter inhibitors. And what they do is they cause your kidneys not to reabsorb the glucose that is filtered in the kidneys. On account of that, you now excrete a lot of glucose in the urine. The advantage that that has is that it helps to, in diabetics to bring down their blood sugar because they're losing a lot of it in the urine. Because the glucose is an osmotic agent, it draws out a lot of water. So it helps because it's now acting as a diuretic. It helps to reduce your blood pressure, which also is of advantage to the kidneys. Because you're losing the glucose, you lose weight. Because the glucose levels are better, your glycated hemoglobin, your level of control of diabetes over the last three months also improves. And then most importantly, it reduces the hyperfiltration and hyperperfusion that happens in the kidney. And the implication of that is that it somewhat prepares, the, I mean, um, protects the kidneys. So it's a very popular drug. All your dapaglyphosin, your empaglyphosin, are all drugs now that are being prescribed, even for people who don't have diabetes. And we're finding that just like we, in the earlier days, were using the ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, that these SGLT inhibitors are becoming, you know, an important medication in the armamentarium for, for looking after patients with uh, kidney issues. So yes, it's a good drug and it's something that you should discuss with your doctors. And if they think it's appropriate for you, they'll go ahead and prescribe. As with all other drugs anyway, they also have their side effects. I mean, if you're excreting so much sugar in the urine, your risk of 
fungal infections, the risk of urinary tract infections are high. And if you're not diabetic, the risk that you might have low blood sugar is also high. So there are complications or side effects that are associated with it. So some care must be exercised, but increasingly we're finding that more and more people are being prescribed it, not just for kidney issues, but also for cardiac issues as well. It's very popular amongst endocrinologists, cardiologists, and nephrologists at this time. Next question. Okay, um, next question is from Paula. It says, what can be done concerning cost of drugs for a post-transplant patient? Very interesting question, and I wish I had a ready answer. Uh, in Sudan, Sudan's GDP is less than half of what we have in Nigeria. But once you've had a transplant, you get your drugs for free. In Kenya, Kenya's GDP is also less than that of Nigeria. Nigeria is supposed to be the richest country in Africa, have the highest GDP. You know, um, and you find that Kenya is able to provide dialysis for free to its citizens on its health, national health insurance. And it's also able to su supplement or subsidize the cost of transplant and also the cost of medications post-transplant. So I think these are things that any responsible government and hoping that whoever comes into, into governance come 29th of May this year will be somebody who will take this on and find a way to ensure that our national health insurance agency develops the capacity to be able to support all our patients, inclusive of those who have kidney failure, require costs of medication, supplements for hypertension, diabetes, cost of dialysis, and also the cost of transplant and post-transplant care. I'm hoping that, you know, through the National Health Insurance Agency, that's where government can ensure that they implement measures. And one other way to look at it is that if they do so, at the early stages, it will reduce the number of people who end up with kidney failure. We're providing you know, support for individuals who have hypertension, the likelihood that they will develop kidney failure is less. If we support, provide screening, you know, um, opportunities, we'll detect hypertension and diabetes early at points when the likelihood that, that the individual will now develop kidney, from, kidney failure from it is less. So if our primary health care is better funded, better managed, it would reduce the numbers that end up requiring secondary and tertiary care, requiring you know, kidney failure care or transplants. So there, I think a lot can be done by government, but a lot can also be done by individuals. And if we should throw everything at government. We all should be careful about weight gain. We should be careful about eating excessively and eating the wrong things, taking a lot of salt, eating fast foods all the time, drinking and smoking heavily, abusing native herbs, herbal supplements, abusing analgesics, particularly your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the use of bleaching creams. I don't see why anybody needs to change the complexion that God naturally endowed him or her with. And you find that these days, even men are starting to use these creams even more than, than women. So these are all things that we as individuals can do and also things that the government on its own should also do to reduce the risks and reduce the numbers and reduce the costs of ultimate care that will be required to look after these patients. Okay, um, next uh, question is, From it says, um, okay, there's a particular person saying I'm here to read that question, but I think I've, I've taken that now. So, um, it says, What's your I am Miss BBB. Sometimes ago, I read about a device that 
has been invented to replace kidney transplant, whereby with this device, there won't be need for immunosuppressant drugs. My question is, how soon would that be used? I think I know who asked that question. How is Yasser? My my greetings to him. Um, yes, you know, there's a lot of research going on as to, I mean, it's believed that transplantation is going in two, three ways. One is developing an artificial kidney. Secondly, looking at the, the possibility of stem cell research to allow just taking your stem cell and making the stem cell develop into a kidney on its own, and then transplanting that kidney. And then the third thing is what you call xenotransplantation, where we're looking at the possibility of taking kidneys from particularly pigs and possibly baboons and tailoring those kidneys in a way that humans can tolerate them. So, I mean, that would be nice if, we, because, a, you know, a, kid, a pig, you know, takes six months to mature. It takes about three months to gest for gestation. One pig can have about 12 piglets. And within six months, that, that pig is, is, uh, is an adult and able to procreate and provide you a kidney. So they're looking at ways of modulating the genes of the pigs so that it accepts, or the humans accept them, and then transplanting those, those um, organs into humans. But research is still very, very far. Nobody's sure whether stem cell would, would uh, achieve the capacity before xenotransplantation, before the artificial kidney. So the artificial kidneys that are now available, that one, they're still very expensive. Two, they come fraught with their own, their own um, complications as well, because it means you, have, you must take blood, put it into this machine, which you then carry around with you. So none of them has reached the point where it is now mainstream and it's still very, very experimental. And one hopes that God endows those carrying out this research with the knowledge such that within the very shortest possibly possible time, mm -hmm. it becomes you know, acceptable and mainstream such that we can then start to you know, make it available to our teaming patients that require this care. But as it is now, there's none that is mainstream. So the answer to that question is that yes, a lot of research is being done, but none is yet available and you know, affordable for routine use for anybody just yet. Okay, um, next is, can, can a post-transfer patient use Foxa medication? Use? Foxa medication, the Foxiga. drug Foxa. Foxiga. Yes. Yeah. I, I had to give a talk recently on the SLT inhibitors and in research around it, yes, some studies have shown that they can use it. We are also be careful about jumping to the use of new medications like this. I would say, you know, unless there are really strong indications for it, not jump to use it. Okay, but if there's a need for it, it's been proven that it is safe to use. But they're still so new that one needs to look at the long-term effects. And you know, we haven't had the opportunity to see what the long-term effects will be. But the short-term outcomes are good, even for patients who had a transplant. Our next question says, they say you can't regain kidney function, only preserve what you have. Person is asking if they say you can't regain kidney function, only preserve what you have. So the answer is trying to. I think I've answered that earlier. The answer is yes, that statement is true. You can't reverse, except you have acute kidney injury. And usually, kidney failure is in two 
of, is of two types. You have the acute kidney injury, which occurs suddenly, and is usually the consequence of, in our own environment, either blood loss or severe infections, which now lead on to kidney failure or an acute obstruction, which causes your kidneys to fail. Use of some toxic agent, which causes your kidneys to fail. Now, if you can successfully eliminate that cause, so the person has bleeding, maybe in childbirth, replace the blood. The person had a bleeding ordinal ulcer or bleeding, um, diverticular disease, you replace the blood. Very often, has an infection, you're able to treat the infection. Kidney function, you can often re you know, return that kidney function back to close to normal. Because what research has also now shown that even though seemingly that person recovers, that person is more likely to develop kidney failure again. And the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in such individuals is much, much higher than other people in the community. So in essence, if you even had acute kidney injury, which is potentially reversible, it always leaves a mark on the kidney, which makes you vulnerable in the future. But with chronic kidney disease, by definition, it is irreversible and it will naturally progress. So what do you do? The only thing that you can do if you catch it early, maybe in stage one, two, maybe three, is to slow down progression. Slow down progression by controlling the factors that have led onto it. When the blood pressure is high, you bring it to below 120, 80. Also, the person has protein in the urine. If the sugar is poorly controlled, you ensure that you control it and bring the HbA1c, or the glycated hemoglobin, to less than seven. You control the individual's diet. Make sure that he doesn't take excess salt, excess protein. Make sure the person doesn't use medications, either orthodox or traditional, yeah. toxic to the That's kidney. Sick, yeah. And then you go for regular checks. That way you can slow down, but you can't reverse it. And you can't even, you know, arrest it. Because even for all of us, even when those of us that don't have kidney failure, with age, your kidney function is going to decline. What just happens is that individuals with chronic kidney disease, the rate of decline is faster than the average person. But all of us, I mean, your kidney failure when you're 30 cannot be the same when you're 70 or 80. And if you then have diabetes or hypertension, the rate of decline is also is even greater still. So we all need to be a lot more careful uh, and recognize that be it active or chronic, you know, the best thing is not to have it. If you have it, you need to make sure that you follow measures as advised by your doctors. And if you're seeing a general practitioner, maybe encourage him to refer you to a specialist who probably has better capacity to be able to deal with the issues that might result. Okay. All right, so um, so the next question is, can a post-transplant patient do intermittent fast? The most important thing is that you must use your medications. And those medications, particularly the, what we call the calcineurin inhibitors, either you're on cyclosporin or you're on tacrolimus, must be rigidly used twice a day and at specific times, 12 hours apart. So mm -hmm. if you are going to fast, how do you ensure that you use the medications at the appropriate time? That's one. Two, you're also expected to take plenty of water to sustain that kidney. So some people say maybe just do a dry fast. And I think a dry fast means that you don't eat, but you can. Okay, but whatever it is that you do, must keep it short and you must continue to monitor your kidney function all through the course of your care of the fast. You know, I've recently had to manage in a patient of mine, their friend who, you know, I mean, the only factor I can find that might be responsible for the kidney failure that 
the person has had is the fact that probably doesn't take enough water. So maybe that's not as innocuous as you might think. Uh, blood pressure and blood sugar that this individual had were all well controlled. So the only factor was probably not taking enough water. And just by reversing that, the kidney function has, has improved. So it's important that um, we follow whatever measures are advised. And uh, going back to your question, dry fast, I mean fasting, you know, I think God listens to all prayers. As I said during the course of the le lecture, in Nigeria, 95% of us pray. But yet, we're not the best country in the world. China, <laughs> only 1% of them pray. I, I don't think it's arguable that uh, Nigeria is not better than China. Or the UK, where only 6% of them pray. So pray, but pray with uh, reason, pray with sense. And as the Bible also says, you know, talk without, without uh, praying without work. You know, it's not, it's not the best. Okay. All right, sir. Um, I have a question. It says the trend. Okay, uh, let me just. This is a follow up question. I think the same person who asked if post transplant patients can do intermittent fast added what of fasting during Ramadan, which I believe question has been answered. So I'm now going to take the next question. It says the trend is now to use infusions and injectables to lighten the skin. And in addition to many places, many places offer lunchtime vitamin infusions as a health and beauty boost. What are the effects of these, if any? So people get to like inject vitamin infusions into their body in order to boost their health and beauty. Well, my attitude to that is that God has created us beautiful. And really, we should limit the amount of interventions that we put in place to try to alter what God has created. Because almost in invariably, every single one of those measures have a negative effect. Um, I think it was Ulasi and her group in Enugu they actually looked at individuals who had used skin lightness. And they found that the prevalence of kidney failure among those patients was much, much higher than individuals who had not. Aside from the fact that many of the agents contain heavy metals, particularly um, mercury, many of them also contain steroids. And steroids, have many negative effects when used on a long term. You might argue that you're putting it on the skin, but I can assure you that the largest organ in the body is actually the skin. And enough of it is administered all around the body to have significant amounts of it absorbed. And ultimately, 25% of the blood that goes out from the heart goes to the kidney. So there's no way, and I think I showed a slide where I said women every day wear about, you know, use about 515 chemicals from the soaps and creams and uh, other agents that are used. And we do know that, you know, there are specific um, agents, particularly these um, tattooing creams that almost invariably are toxic to the kidneys. So in essence, I would say, yes, it's clear that your use of all these beauty things are not necessarily safe for your kidneys. Uh, I know that the risk will be more with some than others, but to be honest, I don't know of any that is completely safe. I mean, there's what you call hypervitaminosis. If you have excess of many of the vitamins that you think are relatively safe. Many of these are toxic to different parts of the body, not just the kidneys, some of it's to the heart, some is to the lungs, some is to the liver, okay? Some is to your immunity. You find that someone who uses kid lightness, if you get an infection, you're not likely to respond to treatment as quickly 
if you ever have to go through surgery, your wound will not heal as well. And it's more likely to break down, more likely to get infected. So please, you know, let's limit our exposure to these agents if we can. Um, okay, sir. So um, for clarity, someone still um, chatted me directly and says that the vitamins are injected in the skin. That is, it's not the same with the cream on the body. And, I, and like I said earlier, even the one you are rubbing on the skin, not to talk of the one you are injecting, these are absorbed. And I can tell you for certain that they would all have their negative impacts. So one needs to be very circumspect with the various therapies that are being, you know, um, you, you, it's not difficult, just Google. And as for the long-term effects, you find a lot of people who use these various um, beauty regimens have cause to regret years back, years later. I remember the early days of, of those skin lightness. Many of the women developed what you call exogenous ochronosis, this lizard-like skin that you get around the neck <laughs> and sometimes on the face that never ever goes away. So you can always tell when you see ah, this one must have used the skin lightness. You call it exogenous ochronosis. So you know, almost invariably, long-term effects are not good. So you might get some short-term benefit, but then I can tell you 10, 15 years down the line, you'll be regretting that you did it. Wow. Okay. So I think uh, I have someone saying, okay, this is well done, well done our esteemed past president and fellow of NN, Dr. Bangui. This, this is actually applauding you, sir. And it says, thank you for it. Thank you and your team. Happy World Kidney Day to everyone. So um, on this note, I just want to still say, if you have questions and you were unable to put it in the meeting chat, please um, raise your hands up. We can actually take voice um, questions. So at this point, sir, I would say you've answered all our questions and we now get to understand more about our kidney health. I don't know. I hope I'm speaking for everyone. Well, I, I really must ah, so, yeah. everyone that has participated and saying that despite the disruption we had in the middle of it all, many of you stayed on. I do hope you've all found it very useful, informative, but more important for me, I hope that it would encourage all of you to better manage your health and ensure that you don't end up in a situation where you now require care for the kidneys or if you do um, have kidney issues, we pray that um, you follow the instructions and your care on the long term is maintained. Thank you all, really, sincerely, for joining us. Thank you very much, sir. Come next year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Meeting has finally come to an end. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you get to join us for other meetings and you get this information on WhatsApp, our Facebook page, Instagram page, and we're also on LinkedIn. Please follow us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you can see Dr. Bangwe on Tuesdays and Thursdays here in St. Nicholas Hospital. So when you call, you'll be booked on an appointment and then you get to see him. Happy World Kidney Day to us all.